I'm on. Um, three weeks ago, um, I already preached on Hebrews chapter 11. There's a whole chapter in the Bible that talks about faith. And I want to read, again, quite a few verses from Hebrews chapter 11 and then just unpack uh, a little bit more about this chapter. Okay. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go, to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable, innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with an endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow, that's quite a chapter. And I didn't even read the entire chapter. So, what do we learn? According to this chapter, what is right at the heart of our life with God is faith. And then lots of actions happen. You know, you conquer kingdom, kingdoms, you quench fire, um, you walk with God. So, Faith matters the most. By faith, we're doing things. So, well, if we agree with that, what is faith then? How would you define faith? Um, we had a go at that one last time, and I, I said probably the easiest and probably almost the best uh, definition of faith is believing God. And that is not believing things about God. It's believing God. You hear something from God, you believe what He promised and said, and that and then you act according to it. You believe him. But when you actually go to the chapter and you go to the first verse, um, Hebrews 11, chapter 1, describes faith in this way. And I got it on the slide. Um, on the first slide, Hebrews. It says, Now faith 
is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So it's a very simple sentence, but it's two phrases that say exactly the same thing. Would you agree? Assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. So there's something present about faith, and that is assurance, that is convictions. You know that you have a conviction about something and that you believe for certain that an expectation is in there that something certain is about to happen. But, so that's the present nature of faith, but it is about the future, about things that you hope for and that is unseen. It's not in the present yet. Your assurance is in the present, but what, what you want to happen, that's still in the future. So that's not overly complicated. That's how it was with Noah. Uh, God warned him about things unseen, you know, things not seen yet in the future. But Noah ended up having enough conviction to start building a, a giant boat on dry land for 120 years. So that's quite a bit of faith. Um, Abraham believed as well. He left his family, his home country, because God made him a promise. He would be a father of nations. He would have his own land. So things not seen, hoped for in the future, but already now you have a conviction and you act according to that conviction. So that's, um, that's the first sentence, but that's the first verse. But if, you get, if we go to the next slide, we actually notice that Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter begins with three sentences and all three sentences are foundational and help us to understand how really faith works. So the first one we already talked about, um, faith is assurance, conviction about things in, in the future. And then the second verse is that when you have faith and when you live a life of faith, God rewards you, he commends you. In verse 6 it's actually summarized in this way, it says, without, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And God is pleased. He's only pleased when we do things by faith. And then he's actually committed to reward people according to their faith. And the commendation, um, who remembers what I read? What's the commendation? How, how would you define that? So if there's a reward that comes out of your faith, what does God do in response to your faith? What's the payload, number one, what we are after? According to the Bible, what did Abraham receive by faith? Righteousness. And that sounds a little bit uh, clinical, but what is righteousness? What does it mean? How would you translate righteousness? Why is it so desirable? Being right with God. You know, right now we're living in a world that is not necessarily realizing, you know, it's not all of Toowoomba quivering in their boots knowing that they are not right with God. No one really worries about it. But according to the Bible, that's our biggest problem. We are not right with God unless He makes us right. And the way we get right with God, the way we become friends with God, the way we can actually inherit all the promises, all the blessings, whatever God has for us, which is eternal life and life in heaven, the way in to enter it is through righteousness, being declared righteous, right in God's eyes. And how do we receive that? By faith. That is big. So if you want to understand the key to the Christian life, it's faith, it's trusting. So, you know, Abraham, we know he got that promise. He would be the father of nations. He was 100 years old before the first son comes. Really, well, the only son. And things would go from there. So he believed against all the evidence. And Noah, against all the evidence, he built all of his life this ship and no rain and, you know, all these, these other people. And God was so pleased by that kind of faith. But what is your faith that gives you righteousness? What do you believe to actually receive from God, to be commended. Hmm. On you in church, usually the answer is Jesus. <laughs> you, what makes you righteous? You believe that that man, Jesus Christ, that was raised in Nazareth, he died on a cross in Jerusalem and that death that to all the world looked like maybe the death of a terrorist or something like that. 
He was actually the Son of God, the Savior that died for you, for your sin. And you believe that after three days in the grave, He rose again, appeared to His disciples. You, you, you believe that? Yes. And believing that, you heard that from God, you have a conviction about it. Believing that, God rewards you with righteousness. He thinks, man, a, a, a people that believe me, that trust me, that trust my Son, Jesus Christ, I declare them righteous. Okay, so it's still foundational. Number three, number three says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So, question to you, why would that verse be in there? That's the only verse where it begins by faith and then it's not a person. You know, the entire chapter, person after person after person, it says, by faith, Abel did that. By faith, Noah did that. By faith, Abraham did that. By faith, the walls of Jericho came down. By faith, the people of Israel lived here. By faith, people did that. And now, it's the only verse that says, by faith, we understand. By faith, God made. Yeah, like, yes. But, but we understand something. And, and this is a key principle to understand about faith. Why would it be in there? Verse 3, as foundational as the previous two verses. It, you know, you're, you, you can guess, because it's actually not spelled out. God is our creator, and he is the one who everything. Yeah, God is the creator. And how does God create? With the word. With the word. He just speaks it into existence. He doesn't need anything. So all, all God needs to do is say it and it's going to happen. That's how the word got into existence. So, like, you know, the whole world, everything is a miracle that God performs. You know, there are natural laws that God uses, whatever, but they're His laws. He just speaks things and they happen. Why is that important for you if you want to live a life of faith? Because you can trust a God that can make anything happen just by saying it. So you are 100 years old, you get a promise of many descendants and numerous stars and, and nothing happens. According to natural law, you're past childbearing age and so is your wife. But you believe in a God that does things like that. He just says something and happens and you can trust Him. It, if God wasn't like that, you couldn't have faith in Him. He could promise whatever he likes, but you just are not sure that he can actually fulfill his promises. You know, one time Jesus really relied on that principle. He's in the desert. He's been uh, without food for 40 days. He's tested, tempted in the wilderness by Satan himself. And he's really hungry. After 40 days, he's really hungry. And the devil comes, points to stones and says, look, turn these stones into bread and you got something. And, um, and then Jesus answers, he says, Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. What is he saying? Usually... Yeah, well, listening to Satan is never a good idea. So he, <laughs> he said that probably in so many words. But he, he was... Very, I used to think... I used to think that Jesus was basically saying to Satan, yeah, I'm really hungry for bread, but right now, you know, like, Satan, you've got to know, sometimes you need a good sermon more than bread. <laughs> because you need to be fed spiritually as well. So, like, get away with bread. I'm really hungry now. I need a sermon. <laughs> uh, that's not really the point of the answer. What's the point of the answer? It's a quote from the Old Testament. And the quote of the Old Testament is from Deuteronomy. And there the people, were, the people of God were in the same situation. They were in the desert. They had just come out of Egypt as slaves. They didn't know desert ways. They were hungry. They, and you know, they didn't know where food was coming from. And then the verses in the Bible explain what happened. Deuteronomy chapter 8. God humbled you, the people of Israel that just come out of Egypt, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. 
which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So what's the lesson there? So yeah, you're in the desert. Yes, you're hungry. But God is not bound by bread. Yeah, like, you know, we, we think in the natural way, you know, to, for things to fix, whatever, for my car to run, I need petrol. Did you, and then, you know, remember the story of Elum? The tank was empty, but he, he gave his fuel money to someone else. And so he had to drive home from Brisbane on an empty tank. And he just declared, Jesus, in your name, it's going to happen. And he prayed and thanked Jesus that the car would run. With God, does the, with God, does the car need petrol? No. With God, do you need bread to be satisfied? No. no. So what did God do in the desert? He proved it. And Jesus quotes it back to Satan. God spoke and food came from heaven out of his glory presence. Angel food. Manna. Manna is actually translated, it's Hebrew, it means, what's that? No one knew manna. It was something completely brand new, God's creative way of satisfying his people. That's foundational sentence number three. You've got to know that, otherwise you cannot trust the promises of God. God can do something out of nothing. He just speaks it. Nothing in the natural needs to line up for God to do something. Okay, that's the first three. Um, if they're all true, and they are in the Bible, we do believe this is how it works. Faith is absolutely central to the Christian life. God rewards faith. God can uh, fulfill His promises and respond to faith by speaking things into the existence. If that is true, how do you live then? Do, 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 you, do you actually live like faith is right at the center of your life? And do you actually understand how the principle of faith works and how you receive things? But it, how would you rearrange your life so all that teaching was more centrally featuring in your life? What would you have to do? Yes. So you would have to hear from God and then do it. So I put it in other words, you have to hear from God, and then you've got to have a faith goal. How many things are you believing for? Right now, sitting here in church, how many things are you believing for? Yeah, you probably all tell me, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm believing that when I die, I go to heaven. I have eternal life with Jesus. You know, we probably all, that's what we... But apart from that, is there another faith goal in your life that you're believing God for? Which it, yeah, I know. You, you believe that your creative business is taking off and paying more than the school fees. See? Yes. And, and you've actually been speaking that. Uh, um, hands up. Who got more than five faith goals? Clearly specified. Ah, that's not enough. Would you agree? If that's really at the heart of the Christian faith, faith, we've got to have more goals. Faith goals. And why don't we have faith goals? Because we're not intentional about it. We're not really going into our prayer time and saying, God, well, what do you think is going to happen in my life? You know, what, what, what is your faith goal for my family, for my work, for my finances, for my health, for my church? What, what's, what's our faith goal for Living Grace Church? Do we have any? <laughs> I shouldn't ask you, Helen. I shouldn't ask you, Helen. Yeah, but like, it's, it's one thing. Ah, oh, we... We like the church to grow and be fruitful. Is, is that a faith goal? Yes. No, nah, that's not really a goal. That, that's, that's hoping. That's a general 
you know, li life will go well, but that's not really, not really believing for anything concrete. Anyway, I, I just, I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Um, how big can you dream? How big is God? But are we, do we actually think we have permission to dream big? Yeah, you're saying yes, but I would say no. Yeah, we think we do, but then when it's really, then you feel, oh God, am I selfish? Am I thinking too big of myself? Am I big not, you know, heading myself? Or just like, we like to be humble and polite and not too much and like, you know, but in the Bible, when you're not dreaming big enough, you become the object of prayer. In Ephesians chapter 1, the church there was not dreaming big enough at all. So Paul writes to them, I pray that the eyes of your heart, so your imagination may be enlightened, that you may know the immeasurable greatness of the power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So like he's basically saying to the, to the church, you're not believing enough. You have power available in your midst that is the same power level of the power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him to the right hand of God the Father. If you have that power available in your prayer time, how big would your dreams be? So I'm just putting that there. Like, don't say we're believing it and we're acting on it. But uh, this morning is an encouragement just to go on that journey. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And you may have not even glimpses in your life yet that that power is available to you. You may have prayed for a few dozen people. No one got healed and you, you didn't bring anyone to Jesus yet. And, you know, the church is not exploding. And, you know, all the evidence is not there. But we're not talking about evidence that you see. We're talking about faith. Right? And the eyes of faith, they hope for things, they, they're things not seen yet. But we're working on a current conviction and assurance and expectation that's going to happen. And we stand on knowing that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead brought us into the kingdom of God and is, is available to us. So dream big. And then, you know, the St. Paul that is writing to that church, hey, got to dream bigger. That power is available. He tells them this as well, just a few verses down the track. Now to him who is able to do immeasurable more than all we ask or imagine, <laughs> according to his power that is at work within us. Did you hear that? Immeasurable more than we can ever ask or imagine. You know, in the Bible, many a time people didn't even hear God. You know, it was not God that took the initiative and said, look, you know, I want you to build an ark. Look, I want you to leave your home and make you a father of nations. It's not even God that took the initiative. People took the initiative. And according to the Bible, that's how it works. If we are belonging to God and we're the children of God, we are invited to dream with Him. And work on vision and goals. And, and sometimes it's not even, you know, in, in the Bible, it's not even super religious. You know, you can say, you can all nod, yes, yes, yes. If I'm, it can't be about me. If I'm, if I'm very righteous and very holy and very humble and, you know, just serving. And I'm nothing, Jesus, I'm nothing. I'm just, you know, it's for everyone else. Like, you know that false humility and, you know, I'm a poor little worm and I'm not worthy of any good things. Like, you know, like God says, what are you talking about? Like, you're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. Why wouldn't I give you things? In the, in the Bible, so many times, you know, people come up to Jesus. I, I don't even know whether they understand who he is. They just are, are driven by need. You know, this one woman, she had blood flowing for 12 years 
And then the Bible says she suffered much from doctors. They, and they, they took all her money. They couldn't fix it. They caused more pain. And the condition just continued. And so she's so desperate. And she's not looking for salvation. She's not looking for righteousness. She's just looking for healing. And then she says, Oh, if I only touch the hem of Jesus' garments, I'll be healed. And then, and then she's healed. And then... Um, Jesus turns around and what does he say to her? Your faith has healed you. He didn't give you a lecture. Oh, it's always about you and your sickness. <laughs> like, have you been to church last Sunday? It's like, you know, he, he doesn't enter into that at all. He's pleased by that kind of faith. And, and that continues throughout the whole Bible. You know, the two blind people, they were desperate as well. According to your faith, be done to you. And then... Do you know that God can be talked around? I'm preaching this a little bit because I want you to start dreaming and have a faith goal. That's, that's, uh, that's what I'm aiming at. So you have something on your heart. And in the Bible, there was a Canaanite woman. She had the healing of her daughter on her heart. And Jesus said, no, it's not my time. It's not the time for the Canaanites yet. So, and she didn't take no for an answer, and she made a fuss and a scene and falls down on her knees and talks back to Jesus and pleads and whatever. And then Jesus finally says, Woman, you got great faith, and according to your faith, it will be done to you. So if you translate into your own situation, what does that mean? You get locked in and you want something from Jesus. And Jesus, you go into prayer about it. You war about it. Jesus, I, I want this. I believe you can do it. And Jesus says no to you. And the intercessors tell you no. So how would you respond? <laughs> if, you, if you're passionate enough about that, you say, I don't care. I still keep bugging Jesus. And then eventually <coughs> Jesus may say the same thing to you. Wow, woman, man. You got great faith, and according to your faith, be done to you. God is that kind of God. You look at me a little bit uncertain. <laughs> I, I tell you what, you know, I like with Tatiana praying. If it's about her girls, she will not take no for an answer. <laughs> right? If she goes to prayer, it's just not an option. She, she would go down in a burning ship praying a certain way for her girls. Right? If it's important enough to you, you're not giving up. And, and, and God, again and again, Jesus commended that kind of faith and said, woman, you got great faith. It will be done to you. Um, even Jesus' mom, God talked him around. Did you, did you know that? So, you know, they're at a wedding, they're running out of wine, and mum notices and says, look, look, Jesus, do something about that, and says, woman, it's not my time yet. And then she just didn't argue with him, but she said to the servants, acting on faith, said, do what he says. No matter what he asks you to do, do it. And then Jesus says, okay, pour water into the jars of water jars, and, and it turned into wine. Is that, a, is that a high spiritual go faith goal to have wine at a wedding? <laughs> yeah, 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 it, it is. <laughs> Free wine. Uh, if, if you've got any sort of religious things, I just want to break that this morning. You can come to Jesus and you can have... <laughs> faith for all your life needs, for whatever's going around you, and you can, can aim high, and you can bank on the goodness of God, and you can bank that when you come to Him in faith, He's willing to reward you and do great and mighty things for you. And I'll give you another one. Peter. Like, we know the story, but how ridiculous is that? So, they're rowing, they're in a boat in a lake, and there's, it's stormy, choppy, 
water, wind and waves, and then Jesus in the middle of the night, he walks towards them. And all the disciples are scared stiff. They think a ghost is walking towards them in the middle of the lake, in the middle of a storm. So Jesus says, look, guys, it's me. He settles them down a little bit. And then, you know, it's, it's all fine. It's all probably a story, a lesson in that. But then Peter in the boat, he says, oh, Jesus, if it's you, I want to come out and I want to walk on water as well. Why? Like, why? I mean, we preach on it. Yeah, like, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to step out of the boat. But why? I mean, this, this is a bit superfluous. It doesn't serve any purpose. It's just a joy ride for Peter. He wants to try it out, right? He wants to have an adventure with God. It, he's not going to save anyone. He's not going to heal anyone. What, what, what point is that going to serve? But Jesus says yes. What else is he going to say? What else is No, Peter, you stay in the boat. Walking on water is just for me. Like, like I, I want you to aim higher, and I don't want you to think that there are things like, you know, Jesus thinks it's too little or not important enough. You know, the Jesus that asks us to pray for daily bread and to believe for daily bread, he's interested in everything. And if we want to have an adventure and, you know, we, we trust in a big Savior and we want to walk on water, yeah, he's going to say yes. So just imagine what you could ask if that's allowed. If you could, I got one. <laughs> we share later. <laughs> Come on. I, I, I give you another one. I give you another one. So Moses, he's, he's on Mount Sinai. And it's amazing. The whole mountain shakes. All the people hear God's audible voice. He's up there in the presence of God. It's so intense. People don't even know whether he's dead in the presence of God. It's earthquake and lightning and God. And God, with his own finger, inscribes the commandments on tablets of stone that he gives Moses. So would you say that's a pretty good spiritual experience of God? Right? Then the people sin. You know, they, they worship an idol. So he has to go up to the mountain again and has another session with God and it's intense again. And God is really angry. But Moses prays, please forgive your people. Don't let us go without your presence. And God says, okay, okay, I, I, I forgive them and I will not let them go by themselves. I go with them. So he does all the prayer job. He does all the things an intercessor does. He brings, you know, it's all done. The prayer session is finished. It got a new tablets of stone. Everything is done. Great. So task orientated, tasks done. And then what does he say? God, show me your glory. How, how does that strike you? Like, does that serve anything? Is that necessary? Is, is, is that not a little bit too greedy? I mean, he probably had the most intense God experience of anyone in the Bible up to that time. On Mount Sinai, and, and then after all of that, God does all of that. He makes a covenant with his people. That it, it's the most glorious worship. And then after that, Moses says, show me your glory. Like, would God have reason to be mad about that? Oh, Moses, don't, are you never ever happy with anything that I give you? Like, why do you always have to ask for more? It's a bit greedy spiritually. I'm trying to teach you something about God. If you ask things in faith and you dream with, he's saying yes. I mean, he said yes. And, and all of his goodness, God let pass in front of Moses. So what, what can you ask for? What is that? Yeah, that's a bit, I read that, it's a blank check, did you hear that? And that's four times in the Gospel of John. And so good, I just read you one. So this, it says four times the same thing, just in case we don't get it. 
Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So is that permission to dream? And, and to actually pray a little bit about your life? What do you actually want from God? What do you want to actually believe for? Okay, how does it work? So, if you're buying into that and we want to have faith goals, how do we get there? So, um, Yonggi Cho, you know, the pastor of the largest church in the world, in Korea, he has a bit of experience how that works. And he would say there are four stages. But I simplify it to two, and I tell you the other two. So, number one is you, you pray. And you sit down with God and you start dreaming with God. Just like you sit down, you think about your work situation, you search your heart what you actually want, you search your heart what God wants, you read the Bible, you're in prayer, and you know you allow the Spirit of God just to brood over you and just see what comes. And don't be surprised if the thoughts are big. We're serving a big God, immeasurable great power. So you're in prayer something comes up. And now in prayer, you've got to discern, you've got to discern whether God is in agreement with that. So it, it's not just blindly pick something. In prayer, you, you, first, you first get agreement from God. Yeah, I'll give you one in the Bible. David really had it on his heart to build a temple for God in Jerusalem. That, that He really wanted that. And you know, he wanted to build that, but then the word came back from God, no, I've never really lived in a house made by man. I don't really need that. And then a little bit later, because David was so persistent, he really loved it, loved the idea, and then God, God said yes, but God said you're not going to build it because there's blood on your hand. You shed too much blood. Your son will build the temple. But David could make plans and arrangements for it, but... So you've you got to have these conversations with God. He may modify it a little bit and tweak it a little bit, but you've got to have a bit of an, uh, uh, an idea that what you come up with, the vision you have, God is behind it. Once that happens, once you so heard from God, the next thing that happens, you pray that vision, you sleep that vision, you praise that vision, you pray as long as it takes the phrase he uses, until you've prayed it through and a conviction has formed in you and a faith assurance has formed in you. You know, faith is tangible. Do you know when you got it or not? Do, do you have faith for a certain thing or not? And you pray as long as it takes until you actually have faith for it. You, you, you're following me? Yeah, you get to the stage that you know that you've got it. That means you have prayed through. And if you're new to this, you've got to experiment a little bit. No, serious, that's, you, you learn by, by doing. So you may think, oh, I have faith for that, but then, then it wavers again and this and that. So how, how does it feel like to have faith assurance? You know, probably you, you just got to be sensitive to that. And it is something tangible. I mean, there's one story. When I first read it, I didn't understand it because that, was all, that whole concept was foreign to me. But there was this pastor prayer line. It was a healing service. And he was praying for healing. And the presence of God was so thick, he really believed that God would heal. And God healed lots of people. But then he, he gets to this one man in front of him. And it's almost like he stepped into a vacuum. He felt completely empty and like, you know, not believing that God would do anything. He just felt lifeless and powerless. And then he prayed for the guy and nothing happened. And, you know, the next guy is fine. But suddenly all faith left him and he noticed. And he tried again and still again nothing happened. And then, I asked, then he asked, brother, why are you here? What, what made you come up? And it turns out he wasn't sick at all. He was a hypnotist that wanted to 
defraud the, the healing movement in Jesus' name. So he, he was actually there with hostile intent. But can, can you see, f faith is something, it's real, it's now, it's an assurance. And he had that assurance, and then suddenly it lifted. You know when you've got it, and you know when it's gone. And when it's gone, you, you enter prayer again. You pray through until you got it, because it's by the Spirit of God. The gift given by God. It's not just holding a worldview. It's assurance. It's conviction. It's something spiritual. Does that make sense? So I give you the other two steps. So according to Yonge Cho, number one is you, you pray and you settle on the vision. And don't aim too low. But except probably the advice is if you're just starting out with that, aim a little bit lower because your faith is not going to reach. Faith gets stretched, you know, small goals first and then larger goals as you get used to God actually being faithful. So settle on a goal and then according to Yonggi Cho, have an unquenchable desire for it. And because that desire is going to help you and fuel you and motivate you to go after it, go after it. You know, be absolutely passionate about it and don't hold back. You know, it's usually the academics or the, the, the people that have a neutral stance about it, they are emotionally uninvolved. But that's not you. You've got a faith goal and it's going to happen. You're going to be the father of nations, so you're not going to be cold about it. You're going to be absolutely desirable about it. And, you know, that desire just doesn't take no for an answer. And so you get that. And then there's the last one. He says, after you have that assurance of faith, there got to be some evidence of faith. So you've got to act on your faith. And the way you do it is you speak it. Like if, if God says, you know, to Sarah, your business is going to turn a profit that will pay the entire school fees of your child and more. That's a concrete faith goal. But if you've heard that from God, you say it. You speak it. There's an, enough money coming in for my child and beyond. Okay? And I, I showed that to you from the Bible as well because I find that neat. Because... Your faith action and what you say does not necessarily depend on how you feel about it. Like, you know, Sarah could sit there and she's just like, oh, it's already March and no money has come in and be full of fear and full of stress and all of that. But she can ignore all her feelings and still speak the word. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, you know, you can say, oh, you know, do I have enough faith? Do, am I full of assurance? Am I full of conviction? No, I'm not. But I can say it anyway. And I say it by faith. It's not a lie, but I'm, I'm, I'm acting on my faith. And I'm ignoring my feelings. And, and, words have power. and words have power. Because even God, He created, He spoke things into existence. So in the Bible frequently... Um, you know, faith action was required when there was a healing. Like, you know, the, the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. And as that person stretch, that's obeying, like that's cooperating with Jesus in the healing, and he just stretched out his hand. I don't even know what he believed about it, but he obeyed that, and he was healed in the process. You know, go wash in that lake, whatever, and, you know, got healed as they were doing that. Go show yourself to the priest. Go and do that. Um a faith action, you know, the, the biggest one I like, um, the raising of Lazarus. He's already four days in the grave. He's already smelling. They, they already weep in buckets of tears. They tell him it's too late. But Jesus says, roll away that stone. And I, I picture myself, that's, that's me. Like, Jesus, four days, what are you thinking? Can't happen, whatever. You, you may have all these attitudes, but you're still rolling away that stone. Which is basic, and that's enough for Jesus. You're still acting on faith. Your heart may not be quite there, and your confidence may not be quite there, but you can roll away that stone and act on it. <laughs> I do that sometimes at conferences, you know. 
preaching is fine, but then you can call them forward for prayer. And you have no indication yet from God that, God, is the anointing going to fall? Is anything going to happen? God, am I lo- going to look stupid? Like, you know, you got all of that happening, and it's like, that's how I feel. But I, I still act in faith calling them forward. Do you, do you, under, do you understand? And you, you do the same. Um, I'll give you another trick. This is Yongi Cho as well, but this is Bible. So you know the vision, you've prayed it through, but then as you wait for the vision, you can waver a little bit, right? You go up and down because nothing's happening yet. God is slow in coming and all of that. There's a really pleasurable way of building your faith. And the way you do it is you, you, you sit down with God in prayer and then you do spiritual sightseeing. <laughs> sightseeing is fun. And, and basically what you do is you go into dreams and vision and you sit down. And so if God promised you a healing, you sit down with God in prayer and you, you look at yourself being completely healed and getting up out of bed and you know, doing a little bit of a jump and you know, you see yourself healed. Or if, you, if God has given you a promise that your family will be saved, you go into prayer and you imagine that you go with the entire family to a worship service. And you just, you know, my brother is not a Christian. And in prayer, I see my brother raising his hands to Jesus and praising him. And as I'm, I'm watching and I'm taking in the sights of promises build up. Because what I see in faith is more real than what is real. Does that make sense? And do you know Clark Taylor? He used a phrase called building in the spirit. Did you remember that phrase? Building in the... That's the same thing. So he, he, would, he would spend hours. He would, he's, he, faith was really central to his whole understanding. So he would sit down in his chair early in the morning with a cup of coffee and he would, he would be in dreams and visions. And he would, he would build a church of 10,000 in the spirit because he would dream about it and what it would look like and probably how big the toilets need to be and like, you know, what is it, 10,000 people roaring together in praise of Jesus and, you know, and as he was exercising faith and praying it through, it's relaxing, it's not strenuous, but it's exciting because that's your passion and you're believing it and you're seeing what God promises in, in the Bible. So just back it up. In the Bible, God did that with Abraham. So Abraham had a bit of a problem believing that he would be the father of nations because he didn't have a single child. And so in the middle of the night, God wakes him up and he says, Abraham, come out. He gets out of the tent and God says, look, look at the stars. Look. And as many stars as there are, that's how your descendants will be. So... This is sightseeing. That's spiritual sightseeing. You know, Abraham, if you struggle to believe, look. Look with the eyes of faith. Imagine. And as you imagine, as you see what God sees, you get built up and get lifted. So I preached for a while. That Latoya, honestly, should I come? T- should I land it now soon? Hey, no, I'm, well, I, I landed. <laughs> so I'm not expanding on this one, but I'm I'm mentioning it because we have hurdles to overcome to dream with God. And, and another hurdle is, how many times have you heard the word said, don't seek his hands, seek his face? Right? Don't seek his hands. Don't seek the things that God can do for you. Just seek his face and be intimate in your presence. I, I can't find it in the Bible. The, the closest buddy to Martin Luther was Philip Melanchthon. And he said, you know, it summarizes his theology, to know Jesus Christ is to know his benefits. 
I, I mean, you can know things about Jesus when he was born and stuff, but all of that is pointless if you don't know why he came and what he means for you. I mean, there, there's never ever a single second in our relationship with Jesus where we are not dependent on him and his grace that he gives us things. We cannot understand anything without him doing anything for us. Do, do, do you understand? We, it's just like saying, you know, you're a mom and you've got a baby that you're still breastfeeding and nappy changing and can't even talk properly and say, baby, <laughs> don't seek my hands, seek my face. Like, No, a, a baby needs your hands and the face and the mature relationship comes later on. Anyway, so if that's a monkey on your back, get rid of that too. Um, maybe the last... Ah, oh man, this... Why is God so pleased with our faith? I finished with that. Why is He so pleased? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But, you know, when you seek Him, you must believe that He exists and that He rewards those that believe. Why is he so pleased and why can't he just wait to reward? Yeah, it shows we trust him. And, and, and why, still, why, you know, is trusting God easy or hard? hard? And why is it hard? In, in, in Hebrews 11, you have the mighty things that people do by faith. They conquer kingdoms. They quench fire. Women, by faith, have their husbands back from the dead. You know, wow, 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 wow. Wonderful. Right? But then I love it. It's honest as well. It says none of them have yet received the ultimate promise. Right? Life was still hard. It's pain. And then others, look at that. How would you feel about that? Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. So that's faith as well. Like we're believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who will one day bring this world to an end and judge this world and bring us to heaven. That's what we believe. But that's only going to happen really right at the end. On the way, lots of things happen by faith, but also people get sawn in two and stuff gets rough and delayed and hard. And you know, there are plenty of times in our lives where we say, God, where are you? Are you actually anywhere? But we hang on by faith and that's why it pleases God. Faith pleases Him and He rewards faith. Okay, so what's your job after this message? Faith goals. Faith goals. Amen. Amen. So Lord...